November 29th that our family, Duncan, Erica, and Sarah, wherever they are, where's Sarah? There she is. Uh, we woke up in the ICU uh, waiting room at University Hospital and said, this is Miracle Day. Sorry. We knew we were running out of time. When the first surgery failed, uh, Dr. Hernandez, who's here tonight, said that we needed a new donor in 24 hours. I said, does that happen? He said, it can happen. So we believed him, and 24 hours passed, 48, 72, and I'm really not sure what kept him alive, but I think it might be because Doug was healthy when he started this transplant surgery journey, and he is one stubborn guy. <laughs> yeah, we like, isn't it Chuck? So it's, uh, it's also thanks to you, of course the medical team, um, but you'll recall many of you, I sent out uh, an email and said, we need a Burke call. So thank you for celebrating this day with us. Let's make it annual. I think you need a glass of wine instead of water. I'll be having those in a minute. Welcome to the guy with the new liver. I remember the time I, I sent a note to John McFarlane and I said, man, if I had a million dollars right now, John, I would give it to you. John's here tonight. Where are you, John? The back. John, like, that was not a pledge, eh? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a hypothetical. That was that if, if I had a million dollars, which I do not, but I think uh, so many of you have asked, how do we contribute? Uh, to help with this cause, and uh, you can certainly uh, give me a check made out of cash. Um, <laughs> million dollars. Million dollars. Great. Um, if you uh, write your check to the London Health Sciences Foundation, and be sure to put in the subject line either Miracle Day or Dunn's name, and then we can be sure that that money does indeed get to not just the transplant team, but the liver transplant team at University Hospital. Woo! As a thank you for the incredible care, and we have committed to match whatever it is you contribute tonight. So for those of you who know, I really want to do Reynolds in the ensuite. <laughs> you want to just hold back a little bit. I'm okay with that. <laughs> no, we, we really do uh, appreciate your generosity and, and are happy to uh, work out a payment plan with John. <laughs> there's so many people to thank there's a few I just want to point out Doug's going to thank uh, more in a few minutes but in particular I want to um, say thanks to my good friend Janet who is so positive it becomes obnoxious <laughs> and who um, actually remembered when I said I wanted to write a book about this experience and every time I talked to her I said how's the book coming <laughs> well, I haven't started it yet Janet but I know we'll have to go away you'll, again you'll have you'll have to get me away again yep. and I would love some wine on the beach and I'll get going I also want to say a big thanks to David Kerwin who is a good friend uh, of Doug's I'm convinced he actually likes me better but has known Doug longer <laughs> who, who has been uh, has been an incredible rock uh, for me especially during the super dark times, uh, there's an interesting exchange of text messages between us. Uh, Doug was supposed to have lunch with David, and the lunch was canceled. David knew this might be uh, coming, uh, and he said, is there something you need to update me on? So there's some unhappy uh, unhappy email or text going back and forth, and then all of a sudden there's a text May 7th from David saying, hey, you guys, we're having cocktails in Times Square. Are you coming? <laughs> so we all, a bunch of us went to New York, and that was Doug's first uh, getaway trip. Oh, nice. 
I also have to say a big thanks to uh, my friend and colleague, Patricia Hoffer. Where's Patricia? <laughs> Wait at the bar! Come on, here. <laughs> thanks, uh, Patricia, for keeping the business alive for the two months that I spent uh, at the hospital focusing on Doug and my family. You are truly amazing. Also, thanks to the food fairies who delivered food to us while Doug was in uh, hospital. And I don't even know exactly who you are or who <laughs> delivered what because you didn't leave us any notes. But whoever made the beef stew, <laughs> it was, <laughs> was it <laughs> Janice, Janice. Actually, it was David. <laughs> OK, so I just wanted to say, you don't have to wait till we're in crisis to bring it again. <laughs> And if you can bring it in small uh, freezer <laughs> containers, that'd be awesome. It's a huge, huge, huge help. Great food. Um, I also have to have, uh, in, in, all of our family was amazing, but in particular, I want to shout out to my sister Heather and her wonderful husband Richard, who just happens to be, uh, as you can tell from the awesome vest with the purple buttons, which is my favorite. He's an archdeacon with the Anglican uh, Diocese of Huron, we call him the Venerable, and uh, was so, um, such a huge support to us, and I know that perhaps his connection to the big guy might help. For us, uh, this second chance at life is like winning a lottery. <laughs> that, that's where the million dollars without the, without the money. Without the money. <laughs> but we do want to make sure that with this incredible gift that we've been given, that we give back in a meaning, meaningful, meaningful way. And isn't it sort of interesting that this would happen to a politically connected lawyer married to someone with a marketing PR firm with a specialty? <laughs> <laughs> so there might be something there. Um, as John F. Kennedy uh, said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. And that's what we want to do. You probably have been watching us on Facebook and know that we've been traveling and golfing, and I'm sure you're all just as annoyed by that hole in one <laughs> as I am. Like, what are the chances? The third time the man goes golfing, I out drove him on every hole, honestly. He won't tell you that, but I did until then on the ninth, and he sinks it. It's just so unbelievable. Um, his luck, obviously. Uh, continues. Anyway, um, we have been having a uh, living life large, as we say, but we've also been doing a whole lot of research and understanding more about organ donation and transplantation. And what we've learned is that, well, uh, over 90% think it's a good idea for us to donate our organs. Only 27% of Canadians have actually registered. So if you have not done so, you are encouraged to do so at beadonor.ca. And unfortunately, I can't check to see if your name is really there, but... <laughs> we're watching. I, we're watching. <laughs> it's so important, and to not only do it, but talk to your family about it. Um, there's three things that we want to accomplish, and we're working with the, the docs and the foundation to make all this uh, come real. I know it's gonna take time, and if you know me, you know I'm not a tremendously patient person. But we're working towards uh, mandatory education of every grade 10 student in Ontario about organ donation, and that's building on the incredible uh, work that Dr. Wall and his team have done on creating a curriculum. We intend to uh, also work with um, Dr. Sharp, who I don't think is here tonight, but he was planning to come. Yes. He is here, he's back at the bar. Thanks for coming, Michael. <laughs> who is incredibly uh, motivated to increasing organ donation. And in fact, he and Doug are making a presentation that came Blood Services Board on Thursday. I'll be scripting that carefully. <laughs> we also want to raise awareness, of course. That's my gig. And I'm working with uh, Western and hopefully getting some federal uh, government funding to help do a study about what it is that really motivates people to make, uh, make the commitment to register for, nation, for organ donation, what doesn't. So if we can crack that code, maybe we can significantly make a change. So we're just getting started. 
and we know there's uh, a lot of work to do. We have, um, as I said, feel like we have one big time and hope that we can do so for many others who are on waiting lists and looking for um, the gift of life as we proceed. Thank you. Well, what a journey over well, the past two years since uh, my diagnosis in January 2014 to tonight. But I gotta say, in the past year, not one, not two, but three miracles. My surgery, the whole in one, and a liberal majority. <laughs> I promised I wouldn't be partisan. That's the ex that's the end of it. But I, I hope to, I'll start by asking you for your forgiveness if I get a little emotional. When you look back at something like this, your emotions run deep. I want to briefly recognize our family, friends, and colleagues who are here tonight. And first of all, my wife Lori, who was always there for me and carried a tremendous burden both uh, before and after the surgery. Her love helped me survive. And our children, Sarah, Duncan, and Erica, who lived at the ICU, sleeping on chairs or on the floor for eight days, they helped care for me both in the hospital and after. My mom and dad, wherever they, oh, there they are. Uh, my brothers, Dave and John, Sister Sue and their families, they were in the ICU supporting us during the worst times. And my brother John, during the darkest days, you know, he, he came forward with the ultimate sacrifice. He said to Lori, I, I want to, to give part of a liver. And Is Lori said, just a minute, I'm not finished. <laughs> Don't interrupt me. <laughs> and and, and uh, Lori said, well, John, it's too late for that. And John said, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about Brother Dave. <laughs> Does that really help lighten things up? <laughs> Sorry, Dave. We're. Nobody told him until now, does And Lori's mother, Shirley, and, and sister Heather, and husband Rich, as, as uh, Lori mentioned, and sister Jane and their families helped us keep hope alive. And the family, my first wife, Anne, is here. Her mother, Gertrude. Where are you, Gertrude? Right over here. Oh, there you are. And her brother John, sister Lenore, the rest of Clan McCall are here. Thank you all for coming. It means a lot. And my colleagues from Western Law and Community Legal Services, uh, I know some of you are here. Um, and uh, Mana's here too. Uh, they have they supported me and helped hold down the fort during my extended absence, which was not an easy thing to do. And uh, thank you all very much. And I can't be among friends without having a connection to, to politics. Uh, his worship, is, is his worship the mayor here? Hey, Jack. Hey, Matt. How are you? Great to see you. Free bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to see you're getting your entitlements. I <laughs> planned <laughs> Matt and I go back a long ways, and I'm so and, and, and I'm so happy you're here. Is, is Ward Four Councilor Jesse Helmer? Are you here? No. Okay. But I, I knocked on doors with both of these fellows uh, during the municipal election just before my surgery, and to help keep me in shape. And uh, I also uh, was proud to knock on doors this fall with my su successor as the as candidate, the new MP for London West, Kate Young. <laughs> My good friend, Glenn Pearson. Glenn, I haven't talked to you. Where are you? He had to go to Oh, jeez. Well, Glenn, uh, as you know, is the former MP for London North Center, and he was here tonight with Jane. And uh, Glenn would came to see me regularly in the hospital, and, and he was always there for me. Um, yeah, the former Attorney General, Chris Bentley, are you still here, Chris? He had to go, too. I know he had to go somewhere, too, but he was a great support. And uh, Laurie's already mentioned uh, Dave Kerwin, who was my campaign manager, and uh, that was a lot of fun, eh, Dave? That was a great time, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and we have we have friends here, both old and new, including some guys from a hockey, Lori's lunch group, my breakfast group, my old law firm, friends from back home in the farm, 
and so many, many others, and words can't express how much it means to me to have, have you all here. In hospital, Lori read to me the messages that you and others sent to me from across Canada. They were sent by email and Facebook, and I just learned today there was even a prayer circle in Kentucky. <laughs> and I'm convinced that those thoughts and prayers kept me alive. I purposely left one group of individuals to the end, and that's the doctors. I want to thank Paul Adams and his wife Marianne Callahan for hosting us for dinner, I'll always remember. And Tony Jevnikar, co-director of the transplant unit, thank you for your tour of your superb research unit, and I am convinced we'll see some big breakthroughs there in the future. Next, uh, Lori mentioned Dr. Michael Sharp, who looks after critical care for the local Lynn and, his, and uh, I love his passion about organ donation. But now those doctors who's, who are responsible for my care, to whom I owe my life. First of all, Dr. Whale Hedera, the head of the ICU, was very kind to my family, but things were, were bleak. I owe a great debt of gratitude to my liver specialist, I swore I was going to make it through. Um, Mark Listick, who fortunately is a better doctor than he is a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> who for, and Mark, for, some, for reasons unknown, I think even to him, decided to do a full workup on me in January 2014 and found that tumor before it got me. And the transplant doctors, first the pioneer in liver transplants in Canada, First, first, don't, first liver transplant, Dr. Bill Wall, who saw me for a consultation. And second, Dr. Roberto Hernandez. Roberto, where are you? There you are. He had the most difficult role to play. He handled the first transplant, which I understand took about 11 hours or so, and found that that liver simply would not function, despite everything he did. And I know he did everything he could. Now, I had a lot of time to think about that when I was recovering, both in the hospital and at home, and I figured out what happened to that first liver. <laughs> I had my first appointment with Roberto after I was discharged. I said, I know, I know what it was. He was a little taken aback. He said, what? And I said, you gave me a conservative liver. <laughs> member of the transplant team is Dr. Doug Kwan. And he performed a number of surgeries on me between the two transplants as well as the second transplant itself. And uh, Roberto Hernandez was off that day but he came in to assist. And I understand the second transplant was not an easy one either. Behind these doctors are nurses, social workers, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and others who together form what I believe to be the best transplant team in Canada, if not the entire world. I heard a dean of medicine was quoted as saying there's only three places in North America where Ferguson would have survived. Houston, Philadelphia, and London, Ontario. Wow. Does that make you proud? Yeah. So we in London need to recognize and appreciate how lucky we are to have them here. So thank you, all of you, doctors, from the bottom of our hearts. I've, I've asked uh, Roberto Hernandez to say a few words. Good evening, everybody. Um, it is, this is great to have all of you. Friends, family from Dog, it's a great honor to have you this invitation. Um, I remember, I will mention some of the medical or surgical part of this, correct? He already mentioned what happened with the family, with, his, with their lives. And from the surgical point of view, I'm trying to make it easier to understand. I remember when Doc came for his assessment, he was, uh, he really needed a liver transplant to survive. Um, his liver has been sick. However, he was very strong physically. He was playing hockey, I think, the night before. Um, so a perfect liver came. Uh, I remember November 25, 
we went to the operating room, 8.20 p.m. Uh, I was with the transplant team, the fellows, the anesthetist team. It was a perfect organ. It's a very nice and beautiful organ. We transplanted the first stage of the operation. We removed his liver. Everything went nice. No blood loss, no blood transfusion. We were talking and chatting in the operation. We were sewing the liver in, the new liver. Everything looks very nice. The liver was pink, the color it should be. And suddenly the liver turns black. So what happened there? So not the first time. So we figure out there's a clot. Sometimes this happens. So we remove the clot and goes back again, pink color. It happened three times, don't know why. So this was a desperate measure because the liver was dying in front of us. Uh, so I decided to do something that I have never done before. So I decided to clamp again everything and take the liver back and try to make it alive and bring it to the back table and flush it. So we flush it, the liver clean, clots came out. We came back again and put it inside. Put it inside, looks nice again, and three times clotted again. So this clearly was something that was rejecting this liver, something was happening that I haven't seen before. <coughs> so we decided to stop the operation, close his abdomen, put him on the ICU. And immediately I spoke with the, the rest of uh, the team, surgeons and uh, liver specialists, hepatologists, and decided to release it urgently in the entire country of Canada. <laughs> Normally a patient who doesn't have liver function won't survive for so long, so yeah. I'm really impressed how you survive for four days. <laughs> and I am sure it's because of you guys, uh, uh, the family, the prayers, the thoughts of all of you and his strength especially that keep, keep him alive because it took four long days to go back to the operating room. I remember again going back to the operating room. Uh, my uh, colleague and good friend, Doc Kwan, that he, I think he's back there, took him to the operating room. I came to, to assist, to help him. And this time, a good liver worked. And we removed the old liver, uh, who has only four days, that it was, it was not in any good shape. We put it back <coughs> inside the new one, and it started working. Of course, there was a lot of things that happened in between of this, and, and that was a really, really uh, uh, miracle what happened that day. We have to come back other couple of times to to remove some bleeding and to work with the bile duct, but everything went well at the end. He stayed two months, two months in the hospital. You saw some pictures, Christmas, New Year, and it was January 24, 26, 26 sorry, <coughs> when he left the hospital, I remember. It was a fantastic day for him, for his family, for all of you as well, as well for us. Um, I, I still nowadays don't understand why he rejected that liver. Maybe because of the political party or something like that. <laughs> I will start matching and checking the credit <laughs> nowadays. Uh, but, but what I know is this is clearly an example. Uh, dog is an example of determination. And you left a message in all of us in the transplant unit, uh, an inspiring message. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you and to be part of the team that uh, helped you to be here and survive. Thank you. So enjoy uh, wine from the bar, and uh, just thanks again for being here.